Yes, sir. Man, oh man. You got it. Okay. Well, guys, I knew we were going to have some IT issues. Uh, I apologize for that. Uh, we're learning on how this stuff works, and we're going to do it a heck of a lot better next time. Um, but kind of back to what, what we missed on. Um, so want to use the well model, be able to talk through that, and then we'll dive into the presentation. So thanks for everybody being patient, um, really learning. We have not used to, uh, uh, Teams or Zoom as much as um, we should during this time. And so this is kind of a good learning uh, application for us. Uh, we spent the last couple of days doing practice runs, trying to get this stuff figured out. And so I think maybe now we have it uh, good to go. Um, anyways, back to what we were talking about, um, injecting gas to displace the fluid out of the well bore to reduce the density of the, of the liquids so that reservoir can push that out. So pretty standard practice. Um, during this problem or during this exercise, all the gas lift valves are open. We're simply trying to close the gas lift valves by removing the fluid out of the tubing case and annulus and lifting that fluid in the production tubing. So this process takes time. Uh, sometimes 24, 48 hours to get unloaded down to that top valve. And then from there, the well's production and operating pressures uh, allow everything else to dictate how far down we unload the well. So once we get that fluid pushed down to the next gas lift valve, we're able to get additional footage of uh, fluid density reduced, lower that flow and bottom hole pressure, and let the formation push those fluids out. And once we get it unloaded down to this one, I'll change the injection rates a little bit and illustrate um, how things look from a gas lift optimization standpoint. So we're starting to bubble a little bit of gas in. As we reduce that density, we gain more differential and able to uh, lift deeper into the well. So when it comes to troubleshooting, when it comes to optimization, especially from the, the gas lift standpoint or the gas lift equipment down hole, um, two things typically arise. Um, injecting where we shouldn't be, meaning that maybe we develop a hole in the uh, upper portion of the tubing, or maybe we have a leaking gas lift valve that's robbing gas from the system. Um, typical troubleshooting issues, and we'll talk about that. Another big one is just simple optimization, increasing or decreasing the injection rate to get the best density reduction. And I'll show you here in our different phase of flow or flow regimes, as I reduce my injection gas, my liquid flow regime changes and I change my flow and bottom hole pressure. So as I decrease my injection volumes, my liquid and gases tend to separate my velocity for those fluids traveling up the surface is slower. So I get this very defined gas and fluid slug formation. As I start to increase my injection gas, I start to increase the velocities that those slugs travel up to surface. And then I can eventually increase my injection gas to get more of a churn or mixture flow where we break up those slugs we reduce the pressure changes at surface and we encourage more fluid being removed out of the well board. But those are some of the things we'll talk about in the presentation. Just like to run this, get kind of a base understanding uh, before we get that practice in place. So with that, we'll move on to the presentation and, and go through that. Good. Yeah, you finish. Is your share? Yeah. Okay. So, guys, this is the uh, first series of our e-learning series that we're trying to take advantage of the the times that people are here at their house or slow in their office that they're able to get into the office and really provide some some learning opportunities um, for everybody. Um, one we want to talk about today is the gas lift optimization 
um, and, and troubleshooting. And so, of course, um, this goes over both applications. Um, with that, we'll be able to kind of dive in, uh, go through um, one, how to identify where we're lifting from, how to make changes to our injection gas, and then three, how to troubleshoot um, once we've identified problems with well. So move on to the next slide here. So one of the first things we always recommend when you're out there evaluating gas flow systems uh, is to understand where we're lifting from and what depth within the system is the gas entering the production tubing and carrying that fluid back up to surface. Very important because the deeper we can lift within the system, the lower the flow and volatile pressure we can get, and then hopefully the more, um, more production we can get out of the well. So with that, we base that on a uh, determining a point of injection. Looking at our surface operating casing pressure, looking at that with um, our opening and closing pressures of the gas lift valves to really understand where we're lifting in the system. And most operators should have some tracking form of the opening and closing pressures of their gas lift valves that are installed in their well. Of course, if you guys can't find it, um, always feel free to reach out to the uh, gas lift vendor that installed the equipment. They should have that information. But in this example here, we have a well with 1,000 PSI surface injection pressure. I can go out to that well, I can physically look at an analog gauge, or I can pull it up on my SCADA system and see, hey, our operating casing pressure has been at 1,000 PSI while we're injecting on this well. From there, I can go over to my PSC, PSO uh, points and understand that at a 1,000 PSI surface injection pressure, my top valve closes at 1,019 PSI, meaning that the top gas lift valve is closed, the rest of my gas lift valves are open, and my injection point is occurring at gas lift valve 11 at 4,444 feet. So understanding where we're lifting from is very helpful when we're starting the optimization or the troubleshooting practice. Each gas lift valve has an operating um, range, and so by knowing that operating range, that allows us to understand where within the system we're lifting, and it also allows us to identify any kind of communication issues, things like holes in the tube or stuck gas lift valves or erosionally damaged gas lift valves really allows us to identify that based off of those operating ranges of the gas lift valve now. So once we know where we're lifting from, um, we can then start to dive into our optimization. And in, in reality, optimization from gas lift is a, is a two-part two process. Um, one, making sure our flow and wellhead pressure is as low as possible to meet the facilities that we have. And then secondary to that is making sure we're getting the correct amount of injection gas into the well to get the lowest density, the lowest soil and bottom hole pressure, and hopefully the most production out of the well. Um, of course, we all know that more gas isn't always better. Okay, more gas isn't always better, so it's always important to understand how much gas can we inject under certain conditions uh, to be able to properly lift that well. So one thing we put together here is a, uh, a basic chart to show, you know, general ranges of injection gas or expectations of gas throughput for different gas lift valves. Gas lift valves are very similar to a uh, orifice plate and a meter run. You size the orifice differently, increase it or decrease it to increase or decrease your, your measured gas throughput. Gas lift valve is very similar, so when we're looking at um, increasing our gas lift valve port size, then we also need to understand that's going to increase the amount of required injection gas volume going through that. So it's really important to understand both your facility setup 
and your injection gas volume requirements before you size your, your ports and your gas slip valves. So uh, when we get into, uh, uh, you know, objectives, key objectives for gas lift optimization, again, simplest form is to best utilize your injection gas and reduce any kind of back pressure you have. Um, so by, by debottling the system, by optimizing the, the distribution of the gas lift, that helps us make sure we get the best amount of gas going to the well to get us the best return. Of course, right now, especially with low oil prices, increasing your injection gas rates to the maximum uh, amounts might not be a good choice. And so being able to run in some of the nodal analysis, some of the gas lift performance curves to understand what injection volume delivers the best production rate with the least amount of injection gas. And then of course, making sure things like uh, uh, gas is allocated correctly to the wells and available out to the compressors so we don't have compression issues, uh, reducing those wellhead pressures is key. So a um, couple of different ways to do it. Of course, with uh, everything in the oil and gas business, a lot of them can be physically going out to the well and walking the, the tank battery to the wellhead and the compressor to wellhead to identify that. There's also a lot of um, kind of uh, production modeling, things like that, that you can use, especially when it comes to planning and optimizing larger fields. So um, typically the way we look at gas lift optimization um, is either through individual well optimization, go out, look at a single well, make recommendations, complete the modeling, and then move on to the other well. Of course, if we're looking at large pads or large fields to get uh, better you know, optimization, better economics through the optimization, primarily adjusting your injection gas, then we can get into multi-well optimization and things like um, allocation practices. How much gas can we send to this well to get the best production for the least amount of injection gas? What size tubing should we be running within these systems to increase velocities, get the lowest flow and bottom hole pressure? Um, and then of course, running gas lift performance curve for the field, um, for the, the areas themselves. So we'll kind of talk about each one of these in the next few slides as we go down. So um, one thing we like to do, uh, especially when we're working with uh, AL techs and lease operators, guys that have the day-to-day the -day operation of optimizing gas lift systems, adjusting those injection rates, is uh, we like these flow charts, these procedures, to kind of get everybody in the understanding as to what, what steps need to be taken first. And so, of course, the first one is always finding that point of injection, making sure that, that we know where we're lifting from, that we're lifting where we should be, that we haven't developed a hole in the tubing or leaking gas valve, things of that nature. Once we feel comfortable with that, that's when we can go into adjusting those injection volumes. And there's a couple different ways to identify how to adjust those injection volumes. Um, of course, critical rate is probably the uh, longest known way of making adjustments with injection gas for gas flow systems. And I'll touch a little more on, on the next slide. Uh, but there's other ways to do it as well. Uh, tubing deliverability curves, um, flowing bottom hole pressure nodal sensitivities, um, difference between uh, total gas and produced gas. So there's a lot of different ways to understand your adjustments on injection rate. And so once you've identified the best adjustment criteria that works for your field, then we can use that, put that into this operations procedure, optimization procedure, and move from there. Of course, the one that we always get a lot of pushback on is after we make those adjustments, let the well settle out for 24 to 48 hours. Um, we find that in the oil and gas field, uh, patience is, is a virtue and, and a lot of people uh, can't benefit from it. So we really want to uh, allow for patience once we've made those adjustments. 
And the reason for it is just the dynamic nature of how gas lift works. If we make a change in our injection gas at surface, that gas has to travel eight to 10,000 feet down into the well bore. It has to pass through a gas lift valve. It then has to reduce the density of that eight to 10,000 uh, column foot of fluid. And then it has to travel all the way back up to surface. With that, those pressures have to change at the sand face at the perforations and start to bring in more fluid. So typically when we make uh, adjustments on our injection gas, we recommend that we wait a uh, period of time before we can make the uh, next adjustment. So recommend 24 to 48 hours. Once we do that, we can get a, uh, a well test, compare it against the change. If we see a positive change, then we can follow that process again, increase our injection rate, and continue to do those well tests until we find a nice stable production um, based off of those changes. And ideally, you can have the data ready when you start to make those changes in injection gas to understand at what path and what uh, incrementation you need to make to, to get out there. So with that, I'll dive into a couple of ways that we use to, um, to model or predict those injection, injection gas rates. So one of the uh, most common types is a uh, tubing deliverability model. We have a question. On, uh, same. A question. He's oh, asking. We got a question, guys. What equation are you using for gas passage? Thornhill Graver, Winkler, Eads, or VPC data? Oh man, that's a great question. Uh, so the ones we use are Winkler, Eads, and VPC data uh, to get your most accurate gas throughput. Thornhill Craver works in a field um, type setting, um, but when it comes to actually designing the gas throughput, Winkler needs and VPC are the most recommended ones. Great question. So um, back to determining our injection volume. Um, one common way to determine injection volume is through these tubing deliverability curves. Uh, these tubing deliverability curves essentially allow us to place different sensitivity or injection nodes against an IPR curve or a deliverability curve to understand as we increase our injection volume or decrease our injection volume, how does that have effect on overall production rates? And so, of course, we can see at the least amount of injection gas, we get the least amount of production and the highest flow and bottom of pressure. And as we increase our injection gas rates, we step down the deliverability curve to where we max out at the highest injection gas volumes. So understanding this allows us to essentially eliminate any outliers as the lowest injection volume and the highest injection volume and allow us to pick a sensitivity injection gas volume in between, primarily probably the green to blue um, gas injection volumes. Um, another way of looking at your injection gas volumes is through tubing gradient curves multi-phase flowing gradient curves. Uh, like these, because they're relatively simple, um, they allow us to run a large group of sensitivities at the same time and really be able to predict flowing bottom hole pressure. So when we're unsure of the deliverability of the well, when we're unsure of our actual drawdown and how it relates to liquid production, um, we typically turn to these multi-phase flowing gradient calculations. And what it does is it takes in a couple fixed items, well head pressure, tubing size, um, water cut, things like that. And then our variable is our injection gas. So we should show that as we increase our injection volume, 
we reduce our flowing bottom hole pressure. Knowing that we're reducing our flowing bottom hole pressure then allows us to understand that what's the best reduction of flowing bottom hole pressure using our injection gas sensitivity. So we can see that lowest injection volume yields the highest flow and bottom hole pressure and highest injection volume yields the lowest flow and bottom hole pressure. But you can typically get somewhere close to that with a lower amount of injection gas. So really like tubing gradients, um, tried and true. If we know the proper correlation in terms of formation, they, they work very well. If we start to look at multi-well um, optimization, field optimization, um, one of the best things I like to run is our tubing or our gas lift performance curve. And we can use these gas lift performance curves with an allocation practice. And the whole concept is we want to pick the least amount of injection gas to get the best production. And we want to make sure that we use that parcel or that packet of injection um, gas that we have within that field or pad and make sure that we allocate that gas to the proper wells to get the best production. And so the gas lift performance curves um, are by far one of the better ways to practice that allocation. Uh, example, when you're dealing with multi-well or field optimization. And what it does is it shows a injection volume on your lower axis versus production rate on your, uh, your other axis. And so it allows you to pick the least amount of injection volume that yields the highest or the most production rate. So especially when you're getting into multiple wells on a single compressor type setup, when you are limited on the amount of injection gas that you can allocate out to the field, gas lift performance curves work really well. One of the uh, tried and true optimization means is uh, critical rate charts. Um, so we've seen a lot of changes within the critical rate charts, um, some operators developing their own, uh, some academia improving on Turner or Coleman uh, unloading critical unloading charts. And so with that, what that allows us to do is you look at a wellhead pressure and a total gas volume to understand is the well at or above critical rate. And so what the critical rate does is it sets, it sets a benchmark for the least amount of gas coming out of the well to minimize liquid fallback. Meaning that critical rate doesn't say at you know, 200 PSI wellhead pressure and two and seven eighths tubing that roughly 700, 750 MCF is ideal. What that tells us is 750 MCF is the minimum amount of gas to prevent fluids from falling back into the reservoir. Now, those fluids might not leave the well, or they might leave the well at low velocities, meaning that they're wetting the tubing and creating slugging, but it sets a benchmark as to what the minimum amount of gas coming out of the well should be. So we find these critical rate charts work really well at a field level when operators want to empower the field um, personnel to do the general well-to-well -well optimization. So uh, we, we encourage critical rate charts. We just like to educate based off of these critical rate charts. They're typically the bare minimum amount of gas needed to come out of the well. A lot of times what we find through uh, tubing gradient charts or gas lift performance curves that were well over critical rate that gets us the best production out of that well. And the reason for that, again, is critical rate is the bare minimum amount of gas needed to, uh, to keep the fluids from falling back. But from a field standpoint, from an operator that has a lot of wells and very few operations engineering staff, um, critical rate charts are a great way to go in and optimize their systems and allow the AL techs and the lease operators to make those changes. Because it's as simple as you pick your average wellhead pressure, your tubing size, 
and it gives you a minimum um, gas coming out of the well. So knowing that, you make up the difference with your injection gas rates, and then you go back to your um, optimization procedure and um, compare that change against the well test after 24 to 48 hours. So um, most of those most of those um, optimization points have been made off of modeling. Um, going in, looking at PVT properties, looking at the design, um, grabbing historical production um, rates, and, and making that, that optimization choice. Um, another tool that we're starting to see used more often is um, utilizing a downhole gauge for optimization. Um, this would be very similar to running a flowing pressure temperature survey um, for optimization. And what this does is this allows us live, real-time pressure and temperature information um, within the well board. And so from an optimization standpoint, it allows us to physically watch the change in flow and bottom hole pressure as we increase or decrease our injection rates. Um, it allows us to identify things like liquid, liquid loading and slugging, um, as well as feed-in issues or holes in the tubing and failed gas lift equipment. Something relatively new for the onshore uh, North America basin, um, but something that a lot of operators have started to embrace um, to utilize this, this technology and this data collection to really optimize. And I'll show you guys an example of, of what that looks like from a pressure aspect and how by making these changes, we're able to um, optimize relatively quickly and optimize against live data. So this is a, a graph that we borrowed from an operator um, that had a live downhole gauge installed in her well. And they wanted to utilize it to optimize their gas flow system. So we were able to go in, see minute by minute flowing bottom hole pressure at the, at the depth of the gauge. A couple of things that we identified over the first few days of just monitoring the well and not making any adjustments was the change in flowing bottom hole pressure on a minute by minute, day by day rate. And what we found was the flow and bottom hole pressure was fluctuating at a relatively high frequency. Uh, I believe it was 10 to 15 um, cycles per day with a flow and bottom hole pressure change of approximately 100 PSI. And so when we started to look at that, uh, we ran some velocity plots. We started to think what would cause that change or that cyclic pressure increase and decrease. And what it was is liquid loading and slugging. And that liquid loading and slugging was being induced because we were under injecting. We were not injecting the recommended volume to get the well um, in a steady state flow. So after watching that, we were able to um, make recommendations, increase our injection gas volume with the hopes that one, we would lower our flow and bottom hole pressure, and we would reduce the delta uh, between the peaks and valleys on our um, cycles uh, of, of slug cycle. So we were able to increase our injection gas volume. Uh, we did that in late March. Um, and with that, we were able to see an instantaneous drop in flow and bottom hole pressure. One thing that really surprised us, because we've always uh, mentioned you know, wait 24 to 48 hours before we make the adjustment again. When we did finally make that first adjustment, it took roughly four days uh, before the well started to stabilize out. So that at first initial adjustment took four days before that well was fully stabilized out. Once we started to see flow and bottom hole pressure flat line, we then decided um, to make that adjustment again further lowering that flow and bottom hole pressure and flattening out the, the production rate. So this was very interesting. This was very new to us because we were able to make a change, 
can physically see that change in flow and bottom pressure as it happened. And we're able to log in. I could log in right before I went to bed or when I woke up in the morning to see how those flow and bottom hole pressures changed um, as we made those changes to injection gas. So something really neat, something new that we're able to learn. Um, it, it cut out the modeling, it expedited the, the uh, optimization by being able to optimize off of change in flow and bottom hole pressure. I also foresee that this type um, will be able to be highly automated to where the system adjusts injection rates based off of the change in bottom hole pressure and continues to, to follow that process as it works its way down. Another question. Yeah. Um, Matt Wilson asked, what is the additional benefit of using gauge for seeing surface injection pressure and knowing which valve we are producing through or, or just our rate? Oh, good question. So wanted to know the, the additional benefits between using a gauge and using the model um, model production and, and injection gas rates. I would say probably instant gratification, the expediting of the system and the cutting out of the modeling. Is it allowed us to make those changes, see them as a live change, and then make changes from there versus having to take the production rates, model that, put a plan in place, and go out and see that. So I would I would say the benefit is the the time aspect of that you can make a change, um, or in reality you can automate a lot of these changes to where as you change your injection rates, the system monitors the change in flow and bottom hole pressure and and tends to, to automate that for you. But good question. Thank you. So with that, um, and wanted to stick to, to time here, um, want to dive into some troubleshooting problems. Um, with that, we, we kind of see troubleshooting broken up into three different sections, inlet, outlet, and downhole. And the reason we like to break this up into three sections is because our inlet and outlet are both at surface, um, typically readily available, uh, and visible and things that can be done to identify uh, any kind of issues prior to bringing in a rig or a fluid bubble shot or a slit line run for any kind of downhole issues. And how we've broken up our troubleshooting into three segments uh, with inlet focused on supply, injection gas coming from the compressor to the wellhead, outlet being wellhead and separator, and then, of course, down hole, uh, the tubulars, the case in the formation, and the gas lift valves. So um, anytime we dive into troubleshooting, we like to start at inlet outlet, uh, since that's two thirds of the system, make sure everything's working there, and then turn our attention to, to down hole issues. So um, with this, I'll talk about a couple common um, inlet outlet down hole issues. And then we can talk about ways to, to get those things corrected. So um, typically inlet is it's our supply. It's what keeps the gas lift system running. So making sure that we have adequate injection gas, adequate supply gas to the compressor, making sure compressor runs on a regular uh, ability. Those things are important. Um, other things uh, focus on calibration, making sure um, our choke sizes or our uh, meters, uh, orifice plate meters are correctly sized so that we're not uh, underestimating the amount of injection gas or causing any kind of freezing. Um, another one for people that still run analog gauges, making sure that the uh, facility gauges um, work, one, and making sure that they're not oversized. See this a lot on new wells where after completion they set a 10,000 psi analog gauge on the casing when we need a 1,000 psi uh, gauge. Uh, outlet problems, typically that's a pressure issue. That's getting the fluids out of the production tubing, sending them horizontal on the flow lines, and sending them to the production facilities. Um, the biggest issue we run into to, from outlet problems is typically high back pressure. Um, 
pressure either induced from the cells line, the separator, or the flow line, but ultimately causing an increase in wellhead pressure, and that increase in wellhead pressure having an effect on overall production and flow and bottom hole pressure. Um, I have this graph here, just generic graph that illustrates the difference, but what we find is for every PSI increase or decrease at surface, that typically translates to a two to four PSI increase at perforations. So that means if we only increase our wellhead pressure by 100 PSI, we have the potential of increasing our flow and bottom hole pressure by 400 PSI at perforations. And so, of course, we know that can affect the amount of injection gas we need to stabilize flow. That can affect the overall production of that well and things like that. So it's always important to understand how wellhead pressure has effect not only on production, but also on how much gas you need, where you can lift within the gasless system, um, the stability of the gasless system, those types of things. So making sure that wellhead pressure is as low as possible, um, kind of my recommendation is, again, dependent on, on distance, wellhead, the, the separator. Um, I like to see my difference between my wellhead pressure and my separator pressure less than 20%. So good practices to go through. You know, you can look at flow lines, you can look at wellhead construction, make sure you remove any kind of directional changes such as 93 elbows. Um, of course, if the well makes paraffin or scale, always recommend to check those flow lines for that paraffin and scale too. And then the, the one that everybody likes the most, the downhole issues. So of course, um, when we get a call, to troubleshoot a gas lift system, the first call is we got to get a bad gas lift valve. Okay, that's possible. What what happened here? Well, our compressor went down and, and our flow lines froze up and we're not making any kind of production, so it's a bad gas lift valve. So okay, perfect. Let's let's walk through our troubleshooting uh, checklist. Let's make sure we can figure out what the issue is. And so. Just like surface issues, we do encounter downhole problems, um, and I listed some of the most common ones. Um, probably the biggest one is uh, a system that's just circulating injection gas, meaning that we're putting 500 MCF into the well, and we're retrieving 500 MCF with very to little uh, production, formation gas, liquid production, things like that. So typically in those cases, the first thing we wanna turn to is a tubing and casing communication. We want to make sure that we have not developed a hole in the tubing at some point and that gas is just bypassing our gas lift valves, entering the hole, um, going in the tubing and flowing back up to surface. So the first thing we want to do is perform a tubing integrity test and on the next slide I'll highlight that. Um, secondary to that, we want to use some tools such as um, fluid level shots, um, flow and pressure temperature surveys, CO2 tracer surveys to, to conclude where the hole is being developed. If we've been able to do that and have not identified a hole in the tubing, then we want to look at um, feed-in issues. Do we have a plug in the tubing? Do we have a sand bridge in the lateral preventing any fluid from migrating into the well bore and be lifted with the, the production tubing? So, tubing integrity test here. Um, is used to check for holes in the tubing, and you, it allows us to utilize the compressor that we have out on location to pressurize the tubing and casing, um, equalize the tubing and casing, and then be able to um, blow down the casing and monitor the change in um, surface pressures on our tubing. So um, tubing integrity test works really well for identifying holes in the tubing within a gasoline system. Another common one is valves being stuck open, um, typically through debris um, after clean out or scale build up throughout the production phase. And so with that, we typically recommend rocking the well um, and or flushing the well with fresh water. And so when, when we rock the well, um, we're again equalizing our tubing and casing 
And then we're blowing down our tubing to essentially create a large differential across the gas lip valves um, to remove any kind of debris. Successfully flushing the well with fresh water with treated water on the backside um, can also help by simply unloading and passing that fluid across the valves with the debris, washing that fluid out um, through the valve back in the production tubing to allow that gas lip valve to, to close. So important things to do, ideally what the rocking, what the tubing integrity tests do is they're not necessarily going to prevent a workover, but they allow you to use the tools that are already out there to troubleshoot or to try to correct the well um, without having to uh, bring in a third party uh, service vendor that's going to charge you money, such as a workover rig or a slick line um, or fluid level shots and things like that, if you can't shoot them on your own. Um, with that, trying to stay on time, guys, but uh, I, I wanted to summarize a table here to kind of give you most common problems within a gas load system um, and how we can and correct those issues. So talking about uh, communication between our tube and inner casing, what you're going to see from an operation standpoint is drop in production. Um, circulating most of your injection gas back with very little formation gas and then also usually low operating or low injection pressures and so your most common things are going to be um, stuck open or leaking gas lip valves and holes in the tubing rocking the well tubing integrity test to confirm that is important if we start to see our injection pressures increase over time um, that's typically uh, something that can be caused through paraffin buildup, scale buildup, plugging of the gas lip valve to where we can physically not get the gas out of the casing into the production tubing um, under the right conditions. So when we see that, checking for restrictions in our tubing, checking wellhead pressures, checking flow line and separator pressures, making sure those aren't increasing is important. Also adjusting your injection gas rate doing the critical rate um, uh, charts, the well modeling to understand best injection rate for it. Okay. I have a couple more questions. Yes, sir. Um, someone asked, does flushing the backside with water risk washing out a gas lip valve? It does if you don't follow the unloading procedure. So when you flush uh, the backside with fluid, it's recommended to minimize your pump rate um, and then after you pump the well um, to follow the unloading procedure um, to get those fluids removed safely out of the well board. And then someone else asked, could you pre please briefly explain the CO2 tracer technique? Yes, and actually uh, here in a couple slides we have a little video for that. So I'll pull that up here in a few minutes. Thank you. Um, so well head pressure, another big one, making sure we can keep that well head pressure as low as, as possible. And then of course one that, that we usually get um, every so often is a sudden drop in production where you have that the cliff if you're looking at your production curves, uh, checking for plug in the tubing, um, plug formation is important making sure that you're actually injecting gas into the system so that a, a, a control choke didn't freeze up or anything like that is is important so i uh, just like to summarize this guys for you most common problems that you're going to see within the system so of course with that we have the tools to be able to go out and troubleshoot these systems and i say we we as industry, uh, a gas lift service provider and operator should have most of these tools to be able to go out and troubleshoot. And they consist of basic information, doing a good well test, getting measurements on our injection gas, recording minute by minute, hourly or daily changes in our tubing and casing pressures. Um, and then some things that, that involve some uh, slick line services, well modeling, uh, things like that so we'll talk a little bit about each one so one of the first things that, that we encourage is proper well test 
gathering the operating pressures, the production rates, water cuts, uh, making any notes about emulsion, sand, uh, things like that. Highly important. And what this well test information allows us to do is to create a calculated flowing gradient. And what this calculated flowing gradient does is it allows us to compare that well test to the installed gas flow system to predict or understand where we're lifting from. So by modeling our multi-phase flowing gradient, we can then calculate our point of injection and then allow us to understand is that where we should be lifting, can we optimize by changing our wellhead pressure or injection gas volumes, or are we lifting too shallow with the well? We might need to do a tubing integrity test for rock in the system. Other really handy tools are a uh, fluid level gun. Grabbing a fluid level um, either during operations to understand where we're unloading or in other cases doing a shut-in fluid level to understand what the reservoir pressure is, how the reservoir pressure is building, and if we're getting adequate drawdown on the well. So one of the things that we like with um, fluid level shots are the prediction of making a change on artificial lift. So if we have a well on gas lift, we can get a shut in fluid level, understand what that reservoir pressure is to make the change of, can we continue on with gas lift and still get the adequate drawdown and production we want, or has our bottom hole pressure decreased enough that now it's time to make a change in artificial lift. And for anybody that's not familiar with the fluid level, um, a Model E echo meter fluid level will generate a, a report that looks similar to this, um, giving you surface pressures if you tie into your transducers, um, fluid level, um, bottom hole pressure based off of your PBT properties that you give it, and then also a collar count for each one of the uh, tubing collars that's in the well. It also helps us to identify or kind of line up with things like gas lift valves. A lot of times gas lift valves can be identified through a fluid level shot. And so knowing at what depth the gas lift valves are installed, you can use that information to shore up um, your fluid level shot. Things, uh, my favorite, um, is flowing pressure temperature surveys. Of course, I like to tell everybody to run flowing pressure temperature surveys because I don't have to pay for them. Um, but they're a highly valuable uh, tool to really be able to go in and gather actual flowing um, pressure and temperatures throughout the well. And so what this consists of is a pressure gauge being attached to slick line and slick line slowly lowering it down into the tubing. Um, stopping at each one of the gas lift valves and then even, eventually ending at the, the end of tubing. So gathers pressure information, gathers temperature information, allows us to make sure our multi-phase correlation is correct, make sure that we know where we're lifting from, what our actual flow and bottom hole pressure is to be able to run some economics on changes in injection rate and um, artificial lift type. And what that looks like is something similar to this, uh, with the red being our temperature gradient plot and the blue being our pressure gradient plot. And so with temperature, we utilize the temperature to understand our bottom hole temperatures, as well as identify a JT effect where our gas is entering the tubing stream. And that JT effect, Joule Thompson's effect, it shows that as our injection gas enters the tubing string and the production string at this depth, that gas expands, allowing for it to cool, and our downhole gauge or our flowing survey gauge picks up that cooling effect at that injection point, identifying where we're lifting within the system. Production pressure gradient um, plot can help with that as well, um, but it can also help us identify our flow regime and how well the, the system is, is unloaded. So we can look for increases in our liquid gradient. Um, that increase in liquid gradient tells us that we have liquid holdup or liquid loading, and then we can make the decision on 
Should we increase injection gas volume? Um, should we add uh, artificial lift? Should we switch artificial lift uh, to get that uh, to get that going? So I really like PT surveys. Um, good information to have. You can run that comparison against the system, and then when you compare it against the install design, you get something that looks like this. So gas lift system installed. Purple is our multi-phase flowing pressure from that PT survey, and blue is our temperature, indicating that we have two injection points occurring within the system. So lifting off the bottom gas lift valve with a possible leak on the gas lift valve above that. So it gives us some idea as to what our flow and bottom hole pressure is and what changes we might need to, to do uh, to correct the issue. Uh, there was a question about a CO2 tracer. So CO2 tracer is another tool we can use to identify um, where we're lifting in the system and, and what issues are occurring. And so this system utilizes um, super order. Hmm. Well, it works over here. It's working over there. <laughs> All right. Do you have it on your computer? Yeah. Bear with us, guys. We're going to pull up the, the C2 Tracer video. Worked yesterday. Yeah, sure, that right. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing and then let me reshare. Okay. How do I? Oh, here you share screen video. Yep. So like yeah. Yeah, start here. Yep. Okay, so guys, apologize, uh, made the switch. So now we have our CO2 tracer. So the idea behind the CO2 tracer is it allows us to monitor CO2 returns that we add into the system with injection gas. Um, and with that return, predict where that injection CO2 is occurring um, at the depth of the stream. So what it consists of is a gas flow system, a uh, naturally flowing well, um, that has our production tubing and uh, annulus. In this case, we have a small hole um, at one point of the well depth. We have a gas lift valve that is closed, not allowing injection gas into the, the production fluid. We have another gas lift valve that is leaking slightly, and then we should have our main injection point at our next gas lift valve. So we have two points that are essentially robbing our injection gas from our system um, and, and preventing best drawdown. So with the the CO2 tracer, we can connect up a, a large CO2 tank, I think usually like 40 to 80 pound um, tank. And we can connect up our gas analysis meter um, on the production side. And so that gas analysis meter will get a baseline CO2 level out of the well so that we know to look for the change against that baseline CO2. And we measure that concentration against time. Um, and based off of the amount of CO2 we inject, as well as the amount of injection gas we're injecting into the well, we can then calculate the velocity um, or time it takes that CO2 to travel down the tube in case the annulus, enter the production stream, and travel back up to surface. And so as this pocket of CO2 travels down, as long as there's no communication between our casing and tubing, it travels at similar velocities as our injection gas. As it passes communication points, such as that hole in the tubing, we get a spike in CO2, 
uh, that is does not correlate up with a gas cell valve. As that CO2 passes our gas cell valve, we should not see a spike in CO2 as it should stay our, our baseline, meaning that that top gas cell valve is closed and not leaking. We know our second gas cell valve is leaking, so it should take a small percentage of that CO2, and that kick should occur at that next gas cell valve. And then the operating gas cell valve should take the bulk of the CO2, so we should get a larger spike in CO2 uh, concentration at our gas cell valve. So by having this plot here, we're able to identify a potential leak or hole in the tubing, confirm that our first gas cell valve is closed, second gas cell valve is leaking, and third gas cell valve is taking the injection gas. So it's a way of identifying where our gas is entering the production stream um, and gives us ideas on how or what to, to correct within the system. All right, let me go back here. Okay. So, uh, guys, I appreciate the time. That was um, that was it. That was kind of a good run through uh, on the first one. We found some errors. We got a. I wish you guys could see it. We got a conference room, and we got five or six guys in here fixing one problem after the next. So um, I appreciate it. Everybody, thanks for for jumping in. Um, we're going to try to do these trainings. Um, every every week, and I promise we'll get better at the IT issues and make it a little smoother uh, for for the next couple of weeks. So next week's nodal analysis. Um, after that, we're going to do plunger assisted gas lift, gas lift 101, and plunger lift 101. So anybody interested in attending them, um, please share the information. We'll share it out with you guys. Um, and go from there. Um, next is Q&A for anybody that is uh, interested. So we've got a list of questions here. Um, Want to just kind of talk through those. Um, so. Can we just hand running? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So one of the questions we had is, do we outsource any of our equipment? Um, from a gas flow standpoint, uh, no. We manufacture all of our equipment uh, here in Houston and, and over in Lafayette. And then a secondary question to that was, how do we load performance tests for a gas cell valve? Oh, okay. It, uh, uh, the question in the chat was, was uh, do, do we have a VPC license? Oh, I see. Yeah. Um, oh, we do not have a VPC license. Uh, we subscribe to Winkler and Eads, which is highly accurate. For the port sizes and the valves that, that we use. Plus, plus, Matt, we we have our valve performance testers okay, to do low range, low range and performance. That's right. Yes, okay. and so we can essentially test our valves internally within Floco to confirm those matches. Yeah, good questions. So okay, here's a really good one. Did you answer the load performance testing? Yes, we do that in house. Yeah. Uh, no, here's a really good question. Um, are there leading indicators that you recommend to look for with paraffin and scale buildup? Um, great question. Uh, one of the biggest indicators that we watch for and paraffin and scale uh, concerns with gas flow systems is the steady small increases and your injection pressure or your casing pressure in a conventional gas flow system. So what happens when you start to build paraffin or scale up in the production tubing is it starts to reduce your flow area. That reduction in flow area increases pressure below it. With a gas flow system, it's just simply trying to find a differential injection pressure over production pressure. So as that paraffin builds up, and starts to increase your production pressure by choking it off. Our casing pressure then in turn increases 
to maintain that differential. So best recommendation is to trend your daily casing pressure. And as you start to see that casing pressure increase without a line pressure increase or a injection volume change, that's a good indicator of paraffin and scale buildup. Uh, let's see, another one was when you flush the backside with treated water, um, the well goes on vacuum, how do you lose control rate? Um, so typically we pump it at a low enough rate that if it does do that, you can still maintain control. Um, I recommend uh, about a half a barrel to a barrel per minute, um, typically low enough rates to cover our leaking valve. Um, another thing that we recommend with that too is to go ahead and shut in your production tubing as well when you're pumping down that. So. Uh, no, I'm just making notes here. If you're done, uh, you got a couple more? I think we got a couple more, guys. Thank you. <laughs> Oh man, you guys are full of great questions. Uh, so this one is, discuss the benefits of using or not using a packer within a gas lift system. Um, yes, it will be covered in the future one, but I will briefly discuss it. So packer and packerless gas lift systems work really well in the environments that are meant for each system. So where we typically see packers being used is highly active fields, new development fields, or in fields that the lease operators and operations group are relatively unfamiliar with gas lift. Packers work great. They isolate the tubing case and annulus. They allow you to isolate the reservoir pressure for any kind of work being done to the well. Um, and then with that, they give you a encapsulated gas volume or gas chamber that you can operate your gas lift system on. They prevent fluids from re-entering your tubing case and annulus during any kind of shut-in times, which require uh, unloading processes and things like that. The drawbacks to the packer is typically the depth that most operators feel comfortable setting the packer at, meaning that we have operators that might only want to go from kickoff points, maybe 30 degree inclination, and that's as deep as they want to set a uh, production packer. So by going packerless, it allows us to deploy the end of tubing um, or the bottom of the tubing string um, at or near the first set of curves, typically around 80 or 90 degrees. And it also allows us to convert from gas lift to plunger lift as the well ages and as the production rates change without having to um, work the well over. So the way I view it is active areas, newly developed fields, packers make sense. As the wells age and go into a brownfield application, low to no activity, lower production rates, lower operating pressures, packerless systems tend to make more sense. And the last one, what considerations would you recommend for horizontal wells for tubing gradient approach? Um, I would look at some of the information that Dr. Coleman has put together um, and uh, what Rob Sutton with Marathon has put together. They've built some really good models for understanding horizontal flow as well as gradient change when it goes from uh, horizontal to vertical. Um, with that, I grab some data down hole, flow and pressure temperature surveys. Um, I complete some velocity plot gradient modeling to best understand uh, which gradients and which approach you should take with horizontal wells. But Dr. Coleman, um, Rob Sutton have done a really good job modeling that. Um, we work a lot with nodal analysis to understand those approaches too. Good. Um, Anything else? Uh, so I just like to a couple of notes. Um, so we did get asked, and if anybody's not following the chat, uh, there's a lot of people that have texted and asked, uh, will we get slides? Um, we are going to try to make the slides available uh, probably via email. 
uh, but we're gonna try to get that done as soon as we can. And then I've already got emails asking about invites to future training. Um, we're gonna try to send out invites to the other trainings later today or tomorrow at the latest, um, and we just do it a week at a time. Um, if you don't want to attend, obviously hit the lead. Um, but we do appreciate everybody that, that is on. We got quite a bit of turnout. Um, I, I was thinking earlier, it's a little bit like uh, Apollo 13 when we first started, and we had some problems. Uh, yeah. You just seen all the guys on the phones and emails and texts, but uh, I think we got it going pretty well. Um, and this is, like Matt said, the first one we did in the, the COVID environment here. Um, we hopefully soon will be able to go out and actually do these in person again. I feel like they're more personable and we can cover a little more in depth at the time, but I think this is a good way for everyone to kind of get some of the knowledge they want um, and be able to still still kind of get the, the things that are out there. Um, so uh, I think that, oh, the only other thing, uh, we had a couple of procedures for like rocking, uh, finding um, holes and tubing, things like that. Um, and the procedures are mostly covered in here, but if you want the actual like procedures, uh, just reach out to any of us here at Loco and we can send those over as well separately. I'll we'll make sure and get that presentation out afterwards. Yeah, and then we're going to try to yeah, email the presentation. Yeah, yeah, so we'll send all that stuff out. Yeah. And uh, before we leave you guys, one last question popped up. Um, at deeper tubing depths in the curve, should you consider the liquid and gas flow rates compared to the tubing capacity? to understand the benefits of reduced drawdown or increase in tubing friction. Yes, you should. Um, the best way to do that is velocity and gradient plots um, and properly size both your tubing as well as your tubing size and your tubing depth to minimize uh, tubing friction that results in the greatest amount of drawdown. So really good question there. Um, our nodal analysis is, is really key when it comes to that. So other than that, thank you guys. Thanks for going through with us and being patient on the startup.